you heat up the ionosphere for a few minutes and then you, you shut it off and, and you watch the ionosphere repair itself. It does that in a few seconds and you do a lot of experiments that way, things you can't do in the laboratory. The first time I visited HARP, I didn't even know what it was. I went to HARP as part of a physics club, the Society of, of Physics Students. I was a student here at the University of Alaska Fairbanks and uh, HARP at the time held an annual open house event where the public could tour the facility and talk to the scientists. HARP is a facility to study the ionosphere, region 60 miles out, out into space. And that, that's a region where there's not much density. The, the air is very thin, mostly plasma, which means electrons and ions. When I saw this facility and saw how unique and interesting it was, so when I decided to do my PhD thesis research uh, using the HARP facility itself. HARP stands for the High Frequency Active Auroral Research Program. The federal government spent about $300 million. It's the most exquisite of its kind in the world. It's currently owned and operated by the Air Force Research Lab. And they have other priorities. They've done some tests over the years. Now they want to go do other things. So it's become a bit of an orphan, sitting down there in Kakana. The U.S. has the lead in the world in this area. It would be a shame to give that up. The other facilities aren't nearly as flexible or as powerful. And HARP can do science that the other two can't. There's a charter that shows and compares all the heaters, including air receivable. And you can see that, that it's quite a bit more powerful and more flexible. It's an instrument that allows us to make small changes to the ionosphere, and then we can measure the response of the ionosphere in the upper atmosphere to the changes that HARP is making. Scientists have categorized the various layers of the atmosphere. Most of the weather that we experience occurs in the troposphere. When we fly in commercial aircraft, we're generally flying at the top of the troposphere. Above that is the stratosphere, and above that is the mesosphere, and above that is the thermosphere. And the ionosphere is basically part of the thermosphere, which extends from about 80 to 100 kilometers altitude all the way up to about 1,000 kilometers altitude. And so the ionosphere is generally what we refer to as the partially ionized portion of the thermosphere. It's too high for weather balloons and it's too low for many satellites. And sure, we can launch rockets through the ionosphere too, as we do at Poker Flat, but those are very fast but expensive experiments. The reason why we care about the ionosphere, particularly for radio communication, is that radio waves, when traveling through free space, behave differently when they travel through a region of charged particles or plasma. Uh, the ionosphere is a basically a partially ionized plasma. And so one of the things that can happen to radio waves that travel through a plasma is that they can be bent, their polarization can change, they can be absorbed. And since so much of our lives is really dependent on radio communication, either communicating to satellites or for navigation with GPS, which is also communicating with satellites essentially, or over the horizon communication or over the horizon radar, it's really important for us to understand how radio waves are affected by the ionosphere, and in some cases how radio waves affect the ionosphere in the case of HARP or other powerful radio transmitters. A lot of us realize how important it is, how powerful, how significant the facility is, so we're trying to figure out ways to keep it alive as an active scientific tool. Why would it be beneficial? I, I can't speak for the applications, but it's a mystery to solve. We can think of the ionosphere as a natural plasma laboratory, the conditions of which are difficult to replicate in an actual physical laboratory. And so this is just another way of, of learning about the world around us. Because if the Air Force shuts it down, by prior agreement, they're required to remediate it, which means they have to go back and turn the land back into the way it was before they started. They'll have to bulldoze the whole site away. 